I am 25 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm currently doing the uh, associate degree uh, entrepreneurship at Hoogschool Rotterdam. This is just the university here in the Netherlands, uh, in Rotterdam, you know, mm -hmm. from the cities. Um, I'm currently in my second year, and um, well, you probably heard this a thousand times, but you know, pensive love for tabletop RPGs, and you know, just do, been doing it for five, to six years. I'm surrounded by a library of them at the moment, <laughs> and there's obscure shit on the on the table right next to me, so. You and me both. Right. I see these bad, it's this badass clauses. I really just want to like step in and kind of look some of your books. It would be very interesting. Uh, but yeah, you know, just, you know, just a hobbyist. Um, but also just have a love for entrepreneurship. And one of the things that I want to start a um, business in is uh, being a publisher for Tabletop RPG. Now, I'm, a, I'm obviously I'm a greenhorn, and that's why I've been dying to interview uh, an expert such as yourself. Yesterday, I had an interview with uh, Zach Glazar from Frog God Games. You might know him. I think he even mentioned you, for, as a matter of fact. And I told him, well, actually, uh, I'm going to interview him tomorrow. And he was very excited about that. He said, yeah, well, I should I'm glad ahead. to hear that. Uh, I have a little preamble about that stuff. Um, yeah, but, that, but we can wait till we move into, you know, interviewish. Part. You mean by Zach Lazar or about like no no I mean no certainly not he's fine no <laughs> no, no, no no subtext asterisk footnote here none exactly um, I was saying regarding no. the issue that we're talking mainly about um, commerce there's right, right. issues of design there's issues of play there's issues of, of commerce and I'm kind of shaping my thoughts on how to jump into that when we get there. Okay, that's awesome. Okay, can, I'm gonna get you might know, but I'm a little bit nervous. I'm very excited for this year. But, uh, anyways, yeah, like I was saying, uh, yeah, but so I want I'm, I'm a good greenhorn. I don't, there's so much for me to learn and uh, so much wisdom. I'm hoping I can absorb from some of these interviews. And, um, yeah, so I had some question, and what I'm busy with right now is kind of a, a little bit of market segmentation of the industry as a whole. Um, I want to try to get some, I want to do some insights. Obviously, I want to provide value, like maybe a really fun and interactive interview. Um, and I want to try to get some insights into, you know, what goes into being a publisher, right? What are all the parties you're going to have to take uh, in account in mind? For example, Zach Lazar, um, uh, me aware of something that I've never thought about. It makes logical sense. It's a sensitivity writer. I was like, wait, what is a sensitivity writer? And he explained to me, I was like, well, that makes logical sense, but that's not something you would think about right away. So um, the, that's one of those those things where it's like, okay, wow, right? Expanded. Um, so I really want to just, if possible, um, uh, really pick your brain into, you know, what it means to be a publisher. Okay. And also I would like to ask you, hope that's not too intrusive as, you know, follow-up section of the interview. Um, also ask you if you were to be able to kind of Explain to me and kind of like, you know, almost typify or personify and then maybe break down um, what your base customer, right? What your, what your central base customer um, base looks like, so to speak. Yeah, um, not, not a problem. Yeah, it's not sensitive information. Okay, no thank, thank God. Yeah. I, was, I just had, yeah, I had to preface that. Here's but, some. I hope that I'm not like being too intrusive or something like that. Um, but yeah, so that's those are basically the questions I want to get into. Um, I guess we could start maybe like about an introduction of yourself and what you do and you know stuff like that. And then we can go on from there, I guess. Well, um, <laughs> having where did I start? <laughs> no, I was going to say you know having uh, having achieved oldstom, I'm uh, I have to really pick and choose. Let's focus on the role playing issue. Um, I have been um, involved in role playing makes it sound like a fetish. Um, I have, uh, I was introduced to role playing. Oh, that's even worse. <laughs> What's it? Yeah, right. <laughs> in 1978, words. I started the thing. Right, right. <laughs> and so um, I was uh, that. I was born in the early mid sixties. And so was in, I guess today we say middle school, I called it junior high. And right. the, uh, the history with play for me, um, includes kind of two big humps. There was the big hump at that time 
and then an almost full stop for some time, a few years. Seemed like a long time. And then another big hump, um, and which brings us into the so into the, the early 90s. Um, and kind of a stumble or a stop or a reconsideration. So there are two points where I really decided whether I wanted to continue to do this thing at all. <laughs> so um, then, so from 1994-ish or five, I think, to the present, uh, I have been extremely active. So both of those humps were very active and included a lot of games. So I I had the, those two phases, late 70s, late 80s, and then this, then I made my, my final decision, I suppose. Um, Still, right. Yes. And now the, the effect of this as well, um, it, or one of the features that may give you some context uh, is that I was born on the coast of California and raised there as well um, on the Monterey Peninsula uh, through turbulent times in the U.S. <laughs> with a great deal of contact across the range. So I was highly politicized family and highly polarized family um, and have direct contact with a lot of history in that region. Um, so another thing to know about me is that my background is not high income by any stretch of the imagination. Um, mm. Pick a nice place on the coast of California, and there are people who pump gas, not just the people who ride around on their ranches. Right. And so, okay. um, however, um, that led me through. Just this is the this is the all about me bullshit. Okay, but it is contextually important. Right. Um, no, no. Uh, I, in an effort not to pump gas or actually more specifically to bus tables, which was my first job and highly motivating. Busting tables? No, bus. Wait, wait, I have to ask, what, what, what does that entail? Like Sorry, bus tables? to bus. The, oh, okay. Right, right. The, <laughs> the, the person who clears the tables and, you know, that all. Oh, that's all okay. Right. No, that, that makes perfect sense. Low, no, man right. in the, low man in the service staff of the, of right. the restaurant. Um, and yeah, so, yeah. and you do everything else too, I might add. But the point is, is that after a summer of doing that, you decide not to do that ever, 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 ever again. And so, among other things, but I was highly motivated to uh, seek um, ed educational opportunities. So I did, um, and both for high school and for college, um, had a, a fairly intensive education that was not very typical. Um, and had ever after, after that had a after that had a, a long academic career. So until 2014, I've been a biologist. I've been a biology professor. So okay. that's that's what I was doing career wise that whole time. Um, and then in 2014, I re retired. That's not the right word. Financially, it's not the right word. I stopped being an academic. And in 2017, my family and I moved here to Sweden. So this, I've had Adept Press since the 1999 or 2000 or so, roughly 2000. Um, and Adept Press, which was an American company, is no longer in existence. And I have begun the company Adept Play here in Sweden. So okay. that, that kind of gives you sort of the, the, the personal right. and publishing right. timing. So when I toss off a term or a year, maybe that can put a little, you know, put a little. Right. No, that, that makes sense. That's like a, yeah, that's, that's quite a journey, by the way. That's, that's a very interesting story. Um, to go from like also, well, I've also kind of been brought up in, <laughs> by no, by no, scratch of the imagination a rich family or any of this you know just been you know slightly below middle income basically and um we, all, we also have had times because my parents themselves have come from cape verde where 
they they know you know they they don't really know wealth in the extent of that you know in the country where I live now, for example, or first of all, that they they know like that. They didn't really have it like that. So I've right. also kind of been brought up in kind of that same environment and. I kind of connect with something you said. You said is that you've been really looking for, or there was a period of time where you've been looking for some educational opportunities to really, you know, um, I can't call it uplift your life. You know, just just to pursue more financial opportunities and stuff like that. It's kind of also where I'm, where I'm at right now is where I, um, it's it's I guess I don't know if it's disingenuous to say I don't want to live the life my parents lived. That's too dis- disingenuous to say, but. I do want to do want to achieve something okay. financially, also just you know passionately. Speaking as a citizen of the of, sorry, speaking as a citizen of the U.S., my interest is less in magnitude than in uh, not being precarious. Exactly. Okay, right. that's a good call. And so um, then that's a big part. Well, that's related to a lot of the things. That we won't go into for purposes of all about me having a definite limit, um, just because of any, everybody else going off. Oh, fuck, he's talking about himself. Click, right? So, <laughs> anyway, well, means, go but, ahead. Well, right, no, in this Mike, case, never. I want to focus more on the role playing side um, right. and how on earth I found myself publishing these things. Okay, probably the one thing that may stand out among the people you're talking with for me is that I actually regard um, role-playing as a wonderful activity. I regard the urge to design to be something of a personality disorder. The idea is that if you play you are often doing for lack of a better word sensible and pragmatic design all the time not necessarily because a given game text is completely deficient but even in terms of interpreting what on earth it's talking about and also let's face it those are words on a page what you actually do among you as a group and understand among another among one another what we do those are the rules. Right. And I'm not saying, oh, anybody can change any rules they want. That's Ron Edwards' permission to change the rules text. No, that's completely misunderstanding my point. <laughs> my point is, right, is right. that the fundamental concept of rules in any imaginable sense is how your table does it. Um, particularly what you and the rest of the people at, your t- at this table trust among one another. Right. That right. this is how we do it. Um, I, as I like to say, if you think I'm wrong, pick up the same game text that they think that they're using and you think you're using. Sit down and play with different rules regarding some extremely fundamental aspects of play at all and see what it gets you. Um, yeah, it's, You'll discover what rules are real fast. I so, think I'm kind of understanding what you're saying, dude. I mean, just just in just in play yourself. Well, obviously, in tabletop RPG with my friends, I think I can, you kind of, I kind of, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, is that, of course, textbook has their guidelines, has their you know, you know, just general rule set and stuff like that. But really sitting down and playing with one another is really what the play is about. And right, the guidelines. If you is, look at it as a musical instrument it's much different from looking at it as a consumable media product. And so in that sense, a given set of game rules um, in it as a text is in many ways saying, well, here, put this together and however it is you put it together is your instrument. And a desire to follow that text very mis- very assiduously is fine. But you're still probably going to get something that's a little bit different from what that guy's going to do. And, that's, that's and, and not true. only that, but therefore, no instrument plays itself. 
So then we talk about what noises come out. And okay, that's right, a different right. thing, too. So if we're talking about what noises come out among us um, and what we hear <laughs> from each other, even more important, what we hear from each other, then we're looking at play. And, and I'm saying you're following fucking rules and you're saying, well, those are just guidelines. Yeah, that's noise. Just noise. What you're doing at this table, those are not guidelines. Right. And so I want to stress that I don't really care whether what's in a text calls itself guidelines or hard and fast rules or not. I don't really care. I think that's a fake distinction. You see, we don't have rules. We just have guidelines. Fuck you. What you have is the potential to inspire right. me or not, whatever you call it. You can inspire me to be excited about how you've said to do it. And if so, I will try to do that because it's fun for us to play with these rules or see right. what their okay. properties wow. are, perhaps. Right. So what, which, when they become rules when they hit the table. Sorry, go ahead, Ryan. I mean, no, you, no bounds. Um, so I once also asked that. This is, this is by, by the way, a very deep quote. And that really makes me think. And to be honest, you're just right. I mean, like, the, also the analogy you're making with an instrument and the noises you, you make. You can disagree, of, too, if you want. I mean, don't get me wrong. No, that, no definitely. <laughs> I'll, I'll, if I disagree, I'll, I'll tell you. But that, that kind of resonates, kind of. This, that's, that's, that's essentially how you play. It's, it's the book is there, and it's there to inspire you. And if, but again, and every DM is, well, for example, every player at the table might pick up the same book, but they might interpret it differently. There are uh, several might, different variables of interpretation that we could talk in some other, at some other time. But, the, might, uh, right. but the key that I'm getting at with this interview is that in this context, and considering that there's some tweakage or ne even ne necessary or absolutely required individualization of the text, um, because of that, the urge, therefore, then to systematize and codify what you've done with it is understandable, especially if you start building up a little you know, notebook of the way we do it. It's like a Tai Chi school. What's the one phrase you'll hear in every school of Tai Chi? In our school, we do it a little differently. Right, right. And so, you, it, it's it's no surprise, yeah, no surprise at all that there will be, you know, either annotations in the text itself or, you know, some notebook scribbles or everybody just kind of Reminds, you know, they cross out something on the little resolution table and write in a different number because that's what we use. You know, that's just going on. But right. when you say, huh, that's interesting. I think I better write up what we're doing all told. Right. I, I think I think I better write up kind of a, of a. Of a summary, because we're starting to live off our annotations and forgetting, you know, what we said. And and it's. We, we, we've got to sort of realize maybe that we're doing something distinctive. Also, there's the contrast version where you say, don't like that. We don't like that. We're writing our own magic rules. You're right. So okay. it's not just tweaks. Sometimes it's like a whole rejection of a section or something like that. And at that point, really... I mean, all the way from some of those interpretations, all the way to this complete replacement of a section or, a, you know, just starting this, the, the book, you know, says, uh, do this, do this, do this. And you're kind of like, yeah, we just don't. We just don't do that. Um, right, right. Now, you can, if you want, continue to play forever with that book sitting on the table and you will go die on the hill that you are a faithful, loyal you know, respectful and book, a book abiding, you know, fan of this game. But if you've sat at enough tables, you know that that claim is often long past its cell date. Um, right, and when, right, right. when somebody at the table pulls up 10 three ring binders, you know, and then starts consulting those for the rules, you're like, I think that's the game. Um, 
So the, the point that I'm getting at is this urge to design is also very real and very constructive a lot of the times, or perhaps it's exploratory. You're like, wow, if this is the way that they've been doing it all this time, well, I just read this other book and it was weird. And then you go, oh, well, let's do this. All right, all right. So there's sort of an exploratory aspect of it too. You know, does this, right. uh, what, what would this be like if we tried this instrument a bit? Designer is the creator. I'm referring okay. to game design as something that creators sometimes do too. Right. Okay. I think I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm understanding where you're getting at. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is that kind of also the design philosophy that goes into that play? Uh, entire game. Entire. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, now the uh, the issue here is that if you lose track of that and start thinking of yourself as Joss Whedon, Alan Moore, Margaret Atwood, <laughs> William Shakespeare, you know, uh, Rod McEwen, God help us all. Um, I mean, all these things, if you're going to sort of fancy yourself as the provider of role-playing to the adoring audience who will, you know, pony up their dollars so they can role-play too at your feet. Right, right. It's completely divorced from the actual realities of this activity. Right, okay, right. So this is something that is, I think, kind of critical to me. Oh, and by the way, I like to refer to the urge to publish as the severe form of the disorder. <laughs> After right, all, right. if you do have the disorder and you're perhaps good at it, right, or whatever, why not just right. have friends and acquaintances play it as they see fit right. and let it disseminate if, if it ever does just because people kind of like it and that's the end of it. What is this thing about, you know, I speak for myself. Why on earth would I bother right. making I mean need I go right. on? I mean why? Why? Right. So that's the severe form of the disorder, and I call it severe form and a disorder because I see what it does to everybody's lives. All right. All the okay. wrong things, it needs to be managed. You need a supportive family and friendship structure. You need right. to understand that the commerce is deeply toxic and will do terrible things for everybody if you're not very, very, very careful. Um, and that you are in a state of destabilizing many, many things about your participation in the activity itself. Um, then and that's, you need, that's this needs management. Right. You need support, right. you need management, so and you need right. people to, to, you know, tell you, you know, you're, you know, sometimes you need an intervention. Okay, right. So these, this, this is not, I mean, I used to call this kind of like a joke, you know, to say it's kind of like this. Haha, -ha, isn't it amazing that it's sort of like this, you know, negative thing. Isn't that amusing? And as the years have gone by. The reality. It, it, I don't think it's, I think it's actually pretty accurate. <laughs> right. So, it's not a joke. Right. And so the right. um, so all of this is my framework for saying where do we gain our goals? I mean, where where does a person find themselves when they have this urge to design? Uh, what are they going to do with it? They don't have to publish. They just don't. And in fact, many people don't. And especially the people who don't quite realize how much design they've done may not even have considered doing so. Right. Now, you mentioned that you're interested in entrepreneurship and you're interested in my history regarding that. Right. I right. need to go to the role-playing history itself. In the mid-70s through the early 80s, so a fairly brief period of time, a decade at most. But to do that, you kind of have to go back before 1974, which I think is legitimate, you know, into the sort of multiple spokes involved. Right. And you start there and you go up through the early 80s. And you are dealing with something that today's audience or today's 
uh, consumer base for role playing would just doesn't believe was the case. They're all zines. They're all zines. Yes, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, is a zine. It's 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 the it's a lemonade stand product. It is, you know, the 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 way you you have a friend who has a game store who owns the local game store, and you beg, borrow, and steal their agreement to throw you a little money so that you can actually photocopy this shit. Right. Okay. Right. Right. And then he'll sell it in his store. Okay. Now you're a publisher. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That okay. makes perfect That's sense. that's how yeah. most of these things get started. I mean the, I mean the the guys at Chaosium in Oakland, California, were at that very same time were cranking off copies of their early proto role playing stuff on a. I mean they they basically threw everything they had collectively into buying this photocopier machine, which they kept in the garage. And those photocopy machines, they didn't quite have to be operated by Arnold Schwarzenegger walking around and around and around them, but close. <laughs> right? So the, um, the, the deal here is that we're talking about basement publishing. I mean, garage publishing is considered top of the line for these things. Okay. This right. is right. basement publishing. I mean, you've, you're using your mom's phone. That's your company. That's your publishing company. Is your mother's phone, and so and, and all of it, yeah, and all of it disseminated through strange pathways, um, bootleg copies, you know, secondary photocopies of just just boomed at conventions, right? Um, hobby stores at the time, which mostly sold lead army men and you know paints in a wide variety of beige and um you know model airplanes and you know a plethora of strange stuff and these are crappy little stores i mean this is the kind of thing which is on the side of a gas station these are not <laughs> emporia these are not retail yeah. outlets distribution exactly. okay. for these things is spotty and weird and okay. um and so some of them will pick up, will pick up role playing stuff, but not in any systematic way. Right. So it's extremely local. People who are interested in conventions and stuff like that would have more contact there. Um, military bases, in particular, they caught on fairly well with service personnel and therefore jumped continents and states rapidly through that. Um, the, the fragmentary materials were very, very common. You would have a book of, part of a book of what used to be a box, you have a book from what used to be a box set, you would have a magazine, and some guy would have figures you were supposed to use. And you're like, how do we play? And so this sort of thing is very, very common, and magazines got going fast. What I'm trying to say is that this, in this context, the idea that anybody who had any way of getting anything into print or you know disseminated out across this, I won't say distributed, that's way too organized, but anybody who had any ability to do this or the, quickly hobby store people and people who were in game stores who had sold board games and chess sets and things. Um, they were interested. A lot of these people are interested. And so you end up with little local communities all over the place. But the stuff, I mean, the actual products, they're, they're zines, they're stapled. They're one step up from photocopied or literally photocopied. I mean, that's, the, that's what you did in your garage. 